Welcome to the podcast, Entrepreneur Perspectives, Building and Protecting Your Business One Podcast at a Time, a CadSource family production. In this episode, we are going to talk about the future, perspectives on running a business in 2017, and competitive cycling. Our guest today is Jared Nichols, president at the Jared Nichols Group and a bike enthusiast. Jared is a deep future strategist, a faculty member at the University of Tennessee, the host of the Road Ahead podcast presented by the NSBA, and author of Waypoint, and a friend. Jared lives in Charlotte with his wife and two kids. Jared is focused on making all those around him better, from his friends to the high-powered business owners he deals with. He has many connections that were built through him giving incredible insight into the future of their business. Jared brings perspective of someone who is able to think differently about any subject or business matter. He is focused on his close relationships, and we love having him around the office. Let's get into it. Jared, welcome to the Entrepreneur Perspectives Podcast. Great to have you. Thanks, Eric. It's, uh, it's great to be on the show. Can I, can I just get a copy of that intro that I can play over and over again when I go to sleep at night? That's right. Even, It'll help you sleep better, won't just it? Just to hear your voice say all this morning. That's great. All right. We're going to get into the show now. So we're going to start, as you know, with about 10 questions requiring a little bit more thoughtful response and end with uh, 10 rapid-fire questions. You ready to get going? Ready. Shoot. Go. All right. Let's go. So you heard the intro. Of course, I can't do it justice in one opening statement, even though maybe I just did that. If there is anything left that you can tell the audience that they don't know, we want to hear that now. Anything at all? It didn't have to be business related? No, not about anything. Me? Anything. Um, well, I'm an army brat. Uh, so I grew up moving around my entire life. And uh, now here in Charlotte, playing, since we have two kids, we're planning on staying in this area. And because of my new best friend, Eric Kazimoff, <laughs> and uh, thank you for acknowledging that on this podcast. <laughs> uh, you know, moving around and, and uh, living all over the world and knowing that lifestyle uh, has given me, um, well, I feel like it's really prepared me for the, the field that I'm in now as a futurist, looking at how to anticipate change and disruption, how to adapt to change. I find a lot, there's a lot of parallels in that uh, you know, from my own upbringing and personal life. Either that or that's just a story I tell myself so I can sleep at night. That works. Either that or you can just reread uh, or re listen to what I said to you at the beginning, right? Yes, which I'm going to every night. There you go. And you can just tell yourself that we're best friends and that'll help you as well. Hey, it's all about how Whatever think, it takes. Right? Whatever it takes. <laughs> so, in your work that you're doing now at the Jared Nichols Group, what is your focus and your ultimate goal for the business and yourself? Yeah, so I mean, if, if I go from a big picture perspective, the ultimate end goal of my work is to create a larger impact uh, in the world around me. And I know that sounds uh, silly because a lot of people talk about that. But for me, uh, what I've realized is that in my line of work as a futurist, as a deep future strategist, um, the ability to anticipate change and disruption, envision alternative future possibilities, this is, this is not simply a uh, plug-and-play process where it's like, okay, that's just one more tool on the shelf. This is a way of completely uh, looking at the world completely differently. And so what I've realized is that this has the impact not only for somebody's business, but even more importantly, their personal life. Uh, the folks that I've worked with uh, over and over again, especially those that have gone through the Executive Foresight uh, Program, um, soon to be the Foresight Academy, which will be coming out this fall, is that the biggest impact for their organization was the change that it made to the leadership and their ability to envision possibilities for themselves as well as an organization that they never would have thought of before. So I've realized that the larger goal for my work and my business is to empower people to truly uh, create the future that they ultimately desire. And we see that with the work that you've done, you know, with the different businesses that we know. Uh, so we, you know, you're obviously doing a good job of that in, in within your company, the Jared Nichols Group. Now, stripping away what you do for the what you do at the Jared Nichols Group, what is besides being best friends, of course, what is your passion? <laughs> My passion. Oh man, well, there's the right answers, then there's the honest answers. <laughs> That's it. Uh, you know. Um, so I look at it in two ways. My passion in my work is watching people transform before my eyes, right? Uh, watching them realize and, and recognize things about themselves they never would have thought possible. My passion in my personal life is, of course, my family. Um, I've got two small boys, and they just, I mean, they capture my imagination. And I've got a beautiful wife. I, uh, I got the better end of the deal here, for sure. 
But, uh, and so inside the family and then in my personal side, just me is, is writing and creating music. Um, I can't read music. I never have been able to, but I've been composing music since I was in the eighth grade. And thanks to uh, advancements in technology, I'm able to start composing all kinds of stuff with instruments I have no idea how to play. So I would say that those are my, you know, my biggest areas of passion. That's awesome. Now, the music that you're creating, are you putting that out there for us to listen to? <laughs> it, is, it is out there. It is. I don't market it. I really don't. In fact, I've got the same goofy business picture as my profile picture on SoundCloud just because I haven't put much time into it. Uh, but yeah, if my music's out there, and if of course if your people want to hear it, they can. It's uh, don't worry, I'm not singing. It's all instrumental pieces of music. <laughs> so yeah, well, it's pretty amazing what musicians can do today, and get they can create music and put it on SoundCloud within moments, right? Yeah. So it's changing uh, the way you can market yourself, which that takes to the next question about perspective on marketing today. You know, you've been in business for for a while. Um, you're Gen X or like myself. Uh, I think we're on the one side of the Gen X movement versus the other side of it, and maybe you can you can tackle that in a second. What you know? What's the difference? Obviously, there's a big difference. What's the difference today with marketing, say from 15 to 20 years ago? Oh, man. Well, I would say that marketing, and again, let me just preface this by saying I'm still a student of marketing. I'm, I've learned, uh, as ties into the Gen X question too, but I've, I continuously look for blind spots in my own marketing. In fact, I mean, Eric, that's one of the areas obviously you and I talk about quite a bit because you've become a real master at understanding the new landscape of business and how to really effectively market to individuals as opposed to large demographic uh, generalities, right? So in the past, obviously, it was always about eyeballs on a television set or on a billboard. So there was really no key targeting beyond age, maybe income, um, or political preference. But now you have tools at your disposal, things like Facebook is the perfect example. You're the one who really enlightened me on this, and I've just been diving in more and more. But you can get so granular on who's actually seeing what it is that you're offering. So marketing has become much more personal, I think, and uh, will only continue to move in that direction, especially as artificial intelligence and big data become much more um, in sync, utilized together, being able to really understand things about your target audience group. <laughs> I mean, the reality is is that uh, Facebook knows more about us than we know about ourselves because of our habits. They know exactly when we're on, where we're checking in, what we're looking at, what we're watching, who we're connecting with. They have so much information, and if they make that information available in one form or fashion to marketers that's just that completely changes the game yeah and it's it's a hard shift for a lot of people to make do you think business owners and say their 50s and the 60s you think they've adapted no i mean well and again i don't want to be the guy that's generalize just, it yeah, it's yeah let's speaking. say we generalize right because i know some people that are in their 70s and 80s they are some of the most forward-thinking uh, people that are constantly pushing the boundaries. But yeah, generally, no, I don't. Uh, and I think this is where you and I can also speak to the fact that we're Gen Xers on the bottom end of it, where we were raised in the baby boomer mentality of the hip hop really generation. Like now we're talking, yeah, man, we, they, we got to say that for a whole other segment, but <laughs> that's, yeah. So we were raised in this, this is how the world works. These are the hierarchical structures. Uh, this is how business works. This is how marketing works, but then everything changed as we were just getting off the ground in our careers and starting to build. And so we've had to really relearn things. So I can look at the mentality of you know the, the older generation and things like Facebook, Twitter, we, and I, this, this is an issue that I've struggled with as well, is that we still, we were starting to utilize these things the same way that we used traditional marketing. So when you have an opportunity to get very personal with somebody and target uh, an individual as opposed to a collective group of people, then uh, you have to speak to them in a completely different language. You've been really good at this. This is, uh, you know, I won't even go on unless it comes up, but you've killed it with my Instagram account. That's a platform I don't understand, but you certainly do. And so you know how to connect with people there because you speak that language, and that's how I've told folks about what you do. Uh, but, yeah, that's, that's the big difference is that it's, it's another language that we don't really understand because we're very face-to-face -face personal. If I can reach out and touch you and talk to you and have a conversation with you, that's how we build our networks and, and market, whereas this new type of marketing is very non-personal. And this is the duality, right? Or this is the uh, – what's that clever word where it just seems like it shouldn't be this way, but – it allows us to get much more personal and granular. At the same time, from person to person, it feels like we're more disconnected than that. 
Yeah, but so, you can use it as an opportunity to engage with people you not, never otherwise would have been able to engage with. Absolutely, right. And then take it to that personal level. So you combine the social media world that we live in today and take it back to the, the roots of business in the 60s and 70s, for example, when it was all face-to-face. Well, yeah, you're right. And, and that's the thing that I think makes it difficult for uh, a lot of folks that are older and even other Gen Xers is that we're able to connect with people that we otherwise wouldn't be able to connect with. And therefore, in our, I think in our own experiences, what we've believed about the world is that we shouldn't be able to connect to them. And so we have to get over that hill of recognizing that, yeah, I can connect with somebody I've never actually met face to face. And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. We, you know, our first, I think you could almost sum it up like this. The difference between the generations is that uh, first point of contact is typically face to face for us. For, for the older generation, for a lot of your Gen Xers, first point of contact for the younger generation is is through technology, through social media. I just now thought of that. I've got to, I've got to write all that. That's it. First That's point it. of Here contact. That's yeah. the new book. The show's right. over. you got to go start writing. There it is. So, <laughs> yeah, we're done here. We're done here, but you're still my, my friend, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. Well, I mean, it's a culture shift, right, in, yeah. in many different ways. And then there's also, we talk a lot about culture and business. And, you know, you come into our office quite a bit, and you're on the road, you know, as we talked about, you're a faculty member at the University of Tennessee, uh, but you come into our office, and you have a way of lightening the mood in the office. Now, of course, that doesn't work for every business. You know, you go to a <laughs> corporate facility, and, and they might have a different way about it. But talk, speak about a little bit um, on culture in the, in the workplace. Well, yeah, so I've, uh, I've worked around a number of organizations, both in the career that I'm in now, but in my previous line of work in the insurance industry. And of course, I spent a lot of time on site meeting with employees, employers, and you get to kind of get the feel and the energy of, of an organization. Uh, culture, you know, the, that's, that's changing so much, and that's, that's, a, that's, that's a conversation that we probably can't fit into this entire podcast. But overall, one thing that I've recognized where you see a greater degree of performance or of uh, output productivity from organizations is when there's a much, there's a, a good balance between serious and also having a good sense of humor. Uh, if you if everything's so structured in a way where people aren't able to connect and relate, uh, which the best way to do that is typically through humor, through lightheartedness, being able to connect, find certain things that you have in common. If that type of environment isn't present, then what you end up having is um, a, a lack of productivity because there's a great deal of energy uh, spent on trying to avoid rather than trying to engage. And engagement really is about finding that common ground, not just of similar interests, but what makes us laugh. I mean, the reality is, is the endorphins that are released when we're laughing and we're having a good time are far more beneficial to us for our overall health, for our mental health, uh, for our productivity than following a rigid structure 24-7. So, you know, when it comes to company culture, I think it, as it relates to you talking about me coming in here to the office, you guys are really just my entertainment. My, <laughs> I come in here just to, you know, to, I come in here to get my own endorphin release. That's, that's what it is. Yeah. But I, that's, I think that's the most important thing is to, uh, you know, to have, a, have, a, have an environment that encourages engagement and, you know. At the right time, at right? The right there's, time, there's a place for it. Yeah. No, yeah. it's amazing what laughter does. It's funny this year, you know, my son started middle school and, you know, some nights were harder than others. Just a couple hours of homework. And one of the things that we started to do at night is we'd turn on Netflix and we'd find stand-up comedy. And yeah. you just, if you find a good stand-up comedian, you can't help but laughing. And you can't help but going to bed with a smile on your face. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. And, you know, maybe we didn't read a book that one evening, but we laughed. And there's a lot to gain from that. So I, it's, a, it's a good way to keep it going and keep a smile on your face, right? And it's funny to, uh, to talk about that and talk about school and the two hours of work. And I know we like to talk again about this a lot. Obviously, we do talk a lot since we're friends. But we're going to talk about education. Um, how it is or perhaps isn't working, and you have two kids like you discussed, and you're always on the look for the right schools. How, how do you think education is going to impact business leaders in the next, I don't know, say five to 20 years? Ooh, five to 20 years. Um, or pick your own range if you'd like. Yeah, so you're, you're talking about education in general or higher ed or? Any education. Yeah, you know, it's education's at all levels, um, however you want to address it. Let's say, you know, kids today, they're growing up and they're so um, fixated on. Uh, it's still the regurgitating what the teacher said. There's a right. lot of lecture series, and then kids are coming out of the workforce, and there's not the same jobs. Yep. You know, we have an intern in our office right now, and he's in here for one week, and he says, I've learned more working with you guys than I have in three years in college. Yep. And you know, I said, well, you still got to do your schoolwork, and you still got to, you know, you're almost there, so finish it off. But 
you know, how do you apply what you're learning in school to the business world when a lot of the stuff may, might not even be applicable? Well, a lot of it's not applicable anymore. I mean, that's, uh, you know, and of course, being on faculty with the University of Tennessee, uh, the, the department I'm in at the Haslam College of Business is the Graduate and Executive Education Department, and these are just wonderful folks. And, uh, and we're actually tackling this issue ourselves. We're having this conversation, which seems ironic, right? Uh, Institute of Higher Education <laughs> looking and recognizing our relevance. But that's what they need to do. and that's Absolutely. What you, yeah. and, that's, and that's why I love working with them. They're, they're great at this. And, and so when it comes to education, it, again, this is, the, this is the change that we've seen from the 20th century to the 21st century. I think will continue is that it's all about our access to information, right? You know, the, the way that uh, civilizations have been built has really been in the dissemination of information. Who has access to what? I mean, you look at the implications that the printing press had on uh, progress in the modern world. I mean, it just blew things wide open. The fact that more people could now read or had the ability to read or that more books were being printed, more access to information launched so many different revolutions and ways of thinking that, uh, we, again, we're not going to get into all that, but it was a major tipping point in human history. And the, the Internet's very much the same way, the way that we have access to information. Now, all information isn't created equal. There's still you can get much more granular about these types of things, but the perception of value is, is what has changed. And, you know, when we were growing up, the idea was that you went, you had to have a college degree. And I'm sure you were told this many times before. I was as well. It doesn't matter what you major in as long as you finish four-year degree. And the reason why is because our entire workforce was structured around the idea of compliance. Uh, if you can complete something, then that shows that you can take orders and you're a good worker and you're somebody worth having. It wasn't that you had a degree in history. Yeah, I've got a degree in history and English creative writing. <laughs> it wasn't, well, he's got a history degree. We should bring him into the, uh, you know, into the, you know, into our business. I mean, it, it was about the fact that you could, you could complete something. Now, what we're realizing is that education hasn't evolved. I mean, the reality is this, is that institutions, no matter what they are, institutions are always going to be uh, bent towards self-preservation. And so this is the difficulty we're seeing in our education system right now. How do we prepare people for a workforce that doesn't, you know, for jobs that don't exist? Well, first you have to have the right imagination about what kind of jobs may exist. And again, this goes back to a lot of the work that I do in envisioning alternative future possibilities. And education needs to grab hold of this uh, right now more than anybody else because their relevance is geared towards the types of people that they're able to put out into the workforce that meet a demand that employers have to fill jobs to you know continue to be successful. But the problem is, is that everybody's kind of shaking their head saying, well, we don't know exactly what type of workforce we're going to need. And so we, we're seeing a shift in value and a sense of value from completing a four-year degree to being competent in an actual skill or expertise. You need to be able to apply your skill set. You need to be able to bring something of value rather than just being able to take orders. And this is a huge and wonderful thing. Employers just need to understand that your life can be a whole lot easier, especially with millennials, if you just let them participate in uh, you know, creating what it is that you're trying to do. Don't, don't try to micromanage them. Yeah. So, yeah. No. Well, I mean, I remember having an internship when I was in college, and I worked for you know pretty well-known bank that's prominent here in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I was, I was doing data entry. You know, they didn't want to, and I get it, you know, I probably walked in there like, we don't want this guy doing anything, right? But we bring an intern in here and, you know, we, we definitely gave, uh, gave time to helping him understand what, what it is we are doing, but we're putting him on the front lines. We're allowing him to create and come up with ideas because we realize we don't have all those answers, yeah. you know, and, and we see it where we can learn. I believe you can learn from many different situations, which, you know, is a big reason, as you know, that our sportspreneur.com blog exists is mm-hmm. we can take, we can create analogies from sports. I can watch a football game and turn that into a business lesson somehow, you know, and, and you with your, you know, avid cycling that you have, uh, you know, is there, when you were doing your competitions, uh, did you learn a lot from that and to apply to your business? I'm sure you did, but you yeah. a specific example. Well, you know, competitive cycling, and again, I was an amateur. I was a professional. I, and I think the amateurs are nuts. I mean, it, here we are, a bunch of grown men that are either riding, <laughs> you know, owning our own businesses or we work at least in a position that we have a lot of free time because training to be competitive required a lot of uh, free time so that you could get out on the road and train. And in any type of endurance sport where you're pushing yourself, that, that's one of the biggest uh, things that you learn is that um, you have to continue to push and go and go, but at the same time get really good at conserving energy. You know, in road cycling, uh, you're spending a lot of time in a group, unless you're one of these guys that's always breaking off the front. But in general, you're riding in a peloton. So very much like in our backyard here in NASCAR, right? 
you know, the same concepts apply. Bikes can get into the draft of another group, and you can sit in, and you're doing less work, and you're conserving energy. And so the ideas of momentum, for example, as I look back in retrospect, I'm a bigger guy, so um, at least for cycling. So I was going to say. No. Yeah, exactly. I'm not that big. You put me on a football field, I'm a twerp. But you know, for cycling, I'm a bigger guy. And so uh, when you're climbing, your power-to-weight ratio is really important. I'm heavier, so it means I have to put out more power in order to keep up with these skinny little guys you know, that are 115, 120 pounds who can go flying up a hill. And what I started to learn uh, in competition was that in order to, rather than trying to push harder, work harder to stay up with them, but I realized that if I use my momentum, because I'm heavier, going down, pedaling down, getting much more of a, uh, you know, a faster start to the bottom of that hill, that uh, I would get up ahead of these guys, and by the time they're catching me, I'm rolling back, I fall right back in line in the peloton, I'm not getting dumped on the hill. And so you have to be smart, you have to be creative, and you have to look for ways to utilize what you have, what your, what, you know, where your strengths are, these things that can be seen in weaknesses in certain terrain, find out ways to anticipate that terrain or that change, and, uh, and, and learn to take that weakness and make it a strength. And that's what I did in, um, in cycling. Yeah, no, that's it. Well, you're, you're trying to cut through it. I mean, not cut through the noise in cycling, right? You're trying to cut through the wind or get around your competition. Yeah, I'm trying to reduce my pain. Right. <laughs> I'm trying to reduce yeah. having to suffer to keep up with guys yeah, that are faster it's than not, I can't imagine. It's not easy. That's not right. You would not find me out there. You know, but not it's yet. it's similar. Not yet. It, it's similar to, it's very different, but it is similar in a way to marketing that we've talked about already, but a specific tactic in marketing is email marketing, mm-hmm. which, um, you know, I think there's a lot of people out there that say they are providing value with their email marketing, but are they, I know you're one that's in email marketing and you do, you're, you're giving it away, right? You're giving insight and ideas away that someone can take and they can apply to their business right away without having to pay you any money. That to me is valuable. Um, what, what do you think of email marketing as it is today? I know you want people to opt into your newsletters that you have, but do you opt in? Do you sign up? When you do sign up, if they're not providing you value, do you unsubscribe? Because you know, obviously you've seen read, you know, the ratios of the amount of people reading it is going way down. It's gonna, can probably can, That trend will continue. Yeah. What's your perspective on that? Wow. Yeah, so this is a conversation you and I have had a lot off, uh, off the recording here. Um, so I'm kind of stuck between these two worlds. When I think about email marketing, what I think about is the end user, right? the recipient of those emails. And my goal is to provide them value and be able to stay in touch with them uh, regardless of whether they purchase anything from me or not. I want to be able to have a way to continuously get to those individual people, even if it's been a year or two since the first time that we made contact. Social media, in a number of ways you can... You're still, you still have people that are out there seeing your stuff, um, but that again, going back to that one-to-one, if I want to be able to, even if it's a mass email, but it speaks to you directly and you reply back to me and said, I really appreciate this, this, and this, well, now that gives me an indicator that you and I have a direct line of contact. Um, and for email marketers, it really is. It's about being able to stay in touch with people that have either purchased your products or downloaded your stuff. Now, the, the difficulty, this idea, I think what it really comes down to in email marketing is moving more towards a, um, a preference model. And, and, what I, and I may be calling it the wrong thing. I, there's a, a buddy of mine runs an organization in another organization. They're working on something like this. And it's where you can... When you opt into something, you have a preference page that asks you how you'd like to be communicated with. To me, I think this is brilliant because I could have a million people on a list, but if only you know a hundred of them are actually engaged, well, that's just a wasted list. I'm spending money for a large list that's you know to, to maintain that. That's not necessary. But if I can have people that actually select how they'd like to be communicated with, two things end up happening. One, I have a better understanding of how I can provide them value at the right time and what it is that they're looking for. And then two. I, it's an immediate sign of interest in what it is that I'm providing because they've taken the time to actually answer that question. And like many people, I'm on the same way. I get so many bulk emails all the time, and a great number of them I don't read. But there's maybe two or three where if I get them, I'm going to open them up. And even if I don't have a chance to open them up then, I at least they're always top of mind. So you got to find that balance between over, you know, overdoing it, but at the same time keeping enough frequency where people where you're still top of mind. Um, and you're providing yourself an opportunity to engage with them. Yeah, you're, you're getting your story out there. 
in front of these people. Yeah. Which, yeah, I mean, it, it, and if you do it in a genuine way, and you and you and and they are listening to you, or at least once in a while checking your stuff out, mm-hmm. and you come up with a new idea, or a new product, they might be there on the other end. But you have to have that unique story that we've talked about quite a bit. You actually did a uh, a podcast on the Road Ahead podcast, I believe, with a friend and associate of yours, Cynthia K. Right, yeah. and it was it's an article actually we wrote on the CAS CM on our content marketing uh, site. And you guys talked about why you need to tell a story in business. And obviously, as the title suggests, we, we discussed the importance of telling that story. Why is telling the story in business today so important? Uh, because that's what's been important uh, throughout human history. That's what makes this really unique is that we tell stories, you know, oral tradition, history, passing down information. This is how we have, this is, this is how we connect and communicate, uh, being able to, you know, we're vicarious creatures, right? I mean, this is why Facebook is so popular, is that we, when people are going on looking at people's, other people's pictures or their photos, we're looking into other people's lives and we're looking for connections. Same with movies or anything. This is the way that, that we're geared. So if you're going to tell a story in business, and business is all about people. It's not just the transaction. That's the bottom line. So if you're going to really connect with people, you have to be able to tell a compelling story that, uh, that they can relate with that they can say, oh, yeah, me too, or that's interesting, that's, that's uh, something I want to learn more about. If it's just transactional, buy this, don't buy that, I'll give you 20% off, blah, 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 then you know, you're not really telling a story. You're just throwing out random information. Yeah. Well, if you're taking that the B2B thought mentality mm-hmm. in many ways and turning it into more of a B2C approach, yeah. but you're just telling stories, and your, your, your statement's so, it's so great because... It's always been the way, you know, take back to cavemen and they're yeah. drawn on walls and we used to read, we used to be read stories too. And we read stories to our kids and we tell stories and, and that's what it's all about. And so the only thing that's changed is the mediums in which they're delivered, be it Facebook, Instagram, you know, listening to a book, reading a book on your iPhone, whatever that might be. That's the only thing that's changed. And well, you're right. And, and to add to that, I mean, you see that this is, storytelling is really important. The problem I think for a lot of organizations is their primary mode of storytelling is about talking about their past and what got them here. Now that's important, but if you really want to uh, reach out and connect with people, you need to talk about the future. And what I mean by that is that you have to be able to create a compelling vision of what the future might be and how you see uh, your, you know, the, the folks that you serve, the people that you, uh, that you serve with your products or services, a better understanding what the future might look like for them and gives you a, a huge advantage over other companies, other organizations to be able to talk about a world that may be unfolding in a positive light uh, and how you're already thinking about these needs that may arise, right? I mean, look, General Electric's great at doing this. IBM is great at doing this. You look at the best, uh, most compelling marketing when it comes to long-term customer retention, it's those organizations that can create a compelling vision about the, st- about the future, those that can tell a story about the future, something that hasn't happened. And they're setting themselves, they, those companies you mentioned all set themselves up to deliver in other areas that yeah. they weren't originally built to do yeah. in many ways. Right. And you know, you're talking about disruption. I mean, we mentioned this before, but there's so many different industries that they just went out of business because of government regulations, a competitor came in there, a natural disaster, or you name it. And had, had they told a unique story beforehand, they would have had eyeballs on what they were talking about, and they could have pivoted much easier. Right. And, you know, look at health insurance agents who aren't able to sell health insurance anymore because they can't get paid for it. Yeah. So what are they going to do? But if they had created a unique uh, audience around their thoughts, who knows what could have happened? Well, yeah, insurance is a great point, right? It's either transactional or relational. Uh, so if, if your whole value of your business was that you could get somebody a better price on an insurance policy, well, you don't have any staying p- power in that client's mind. Yeah. But if your value extended beyond that because of your ability to solve problems, think differently, advise them in other ways, now you've created the ability to generate revenue in other, um, in other ways outside of commission-based products. Yeah. That's it. Well, and that's a big concern for businesses right now. They have a big fear. So let's tap into your fear. Uh, What is the biggest fear that you have in your business life? Um, In my business life, I would say that, you know, something that I, um, that I would look at as a fear or as a, something that I always keep in, in the front of my mind is, is getting off track. And what I mean by that is, 
uh, like most entrepreneurs, you know, I've never worked for anybody. I've told somebody this before. I've never collected a salary and benefits ever. I've, when I got out of college, I started working for myself, went into the insurance industry. And uh, so that's all I've ever actually known. And so the fear or the concern that I keep in front of me is making sure that the end goal, what it is that I'm trying to accomplish, what my purpose actually is, and not to sound cheesy here, but that everything that I'm doing is leading towards that end goal. I don't always have to know exactly what it looks like, but it's very easy to get you know, off track, especially as new opportunities start to arise. And the irony, of course, is that the more on purpose or on point you are, knowing very clearly what it is you're trying to accomplish, uh, the more that that starts to take shape, the more these newer opportunities start to show up, both that are in line with that, but also a ton that are outside of that because you're generating excitement. You're getting people excited about what it is that you're doing. And other folks are looking for that. They're looking for inspiration. So to be very um, uh, just vigilant, if you will, yeah. about making sure that I'm not putting time and energy into things that uh, uh, that are not working towards the ultimate. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense because there's so many distractions, more so than (laughs) ever. You know, you could be just looking on Facebook as an example and you could get sidetracked very easily with with something that's going on or a new idea, but it's also on the flip side of it, it could be a concern because... What if you walk past the greatest thing that could have happened to you because you were too fearful of that side thing that was going on? Yeah, you know, and I guess it depends on how it's you a balance. So yeah, it really is. I mean, I you know, I'm not really afraid, and I guess fear is one of those words that different people have different definitions for. It. I think the, the main thing is just always saying, okay, what is it that you need to watch out for that could trip you up? Um, you know, fear can be uh, debilitating, but uh, being vigilant is is empowering. Don't go anywhere because we are going into some rapid fire questions right after we thank our sponsor. West Connor Insurance is a leading property and casualty agency in Charlotte, North Carolina. Thanks to their love of entrepreneurialism and insurance, they have sponsored this podcast. You can find the office of West Connor Insurance on Providence Road in South Charlotte, North Carolina, near the new developments of Waverly Place and Ray Farms. If you are looking to get a quote on your auto or home insurance policy, give Wes and his staff a call at 704 665 5340, or you can find them online at westconnor.com. Those are the thoughtful questions. I think you did a great job. Thanks, and now we're going to move. Of course, that's what friends are for. So now we're going to move to the rapid fire round. It's oh going to go quick. Okay. You're the goalie. I'm going to fire some pucks at you. What, what sport you may, is that? This, yeah, that's right. <laughs> it, we'll get to that. And a few may be a little bit more difficult. So if you have to take your time, we'll give you a pass on that. Okay. What book are you reading right now? Right now, I just started reading a book. So I, I'm reading a few different books, but the one that I'm reading right now I'm really enjoying is uh, a book called Give by uh, Nicholas Kuzmich. I think I'm saying his name right. Nicholas, I apologize if I'm getting that wrong. Uh, he is recognized as the number one Facebook ad strategist, I think, right now in the world. I mean, and just reading his book is incredible. So that's what I'm reading. Excellent. Uh, How are you reading that? How am I reading yeah, that? I'm reading that on Which Kindle. Are, okay. Yeah. On a Kindle, on your mm-hmm. on an app or the actual Kindle device? No, on my phone. On okay. The app, yeah. the Kindle app. All right. Very cool. Mm-hmm. I do the same thing. What is your favorite social media network and why? <sighs> my favorite? That's a tough question. I don't know that I have a favorite. <laughs> I would say um, uh, I'd probably have to go with Facebook right now. At least that's, I'd say where my, most of my time is invested just because you can get so granular with it. Obviously, I mean, liking Nick's, Nicholas's book, uh, Give, is an indicator that I think that's where the greatest opportunities are. LinkedIn yeah. has a long way to go, uh, but Facebook seems to really have, you know, hold the market. Yeah. What social media app do you just not get? Snapchat. Yeah. Don't get it. But that's, you know, that's just me. <laughs> that's it. What phone app do you have on your phone that's most important to you? Close. It's the CRM system I use called C-L-O-Z-E. I think it's probably the most uh, close to the way that I look at uh, managing um, relationships. It focuses tasks, projects, and everything else around people rather than around all these other arbitrary factors that so many CRMs have. Uh, And then on top of that, it utilizes artificial intelligence to scan all of your documents, folders. It's a little big brother. Yeah, it's pretty pretty incredible. That's good. Well, we're going to put those and and some of the other things in the description here. So what is one thing you would tell an up-and-coming entrepreneur to focus on if they're getting started? Uh, do, do not focus on immediate market need. You're, it's, that's a late entry game. 
what I would say is if somebody is, is really looking at getting started, start to identify where needs may begin to arise. Get really good at envisioning how the implications of trends and issues that we see today could start to create um, different types of future outcomes uh, for the type of people that you're wanting to work with, the type of people you're trying to serve. That's really the key. If you can start to talk about or focus your time and energy on, um, on a market that may or may not exist yet, then you're going to have a, a huge advantage over others. Otherwise, you're going to be chasing uh, the big companies and the well-established organizations. Well said. What's a personal story that got you where you are today? Personal story that got me where I am today? Ooh, man. Well, um, it would be something your kid told you this morning even. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, I don't know if we can... <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I would say that uh, for me, where where I am today, uh, personal story is I've had some really amazing people in my life, personally, professionally, that have encouraged me, have assisted me to help me get where I am today. I think that all too often we buy into this um, uh, this myth that you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps and be you know do it all on your own. That's just not true. Uh, it still requires hard work. I'm not talking about taking a free ride, but. Um, I've had people that have invested time and energy into me uh, that has been, and they continue to do so. Yeah. That's been the most important thing to me is that the value of relationships and people um, are huge. And never, ever forget who helped you get to where you are. I think too often people do that and think that they just got there on their own. That's the quickest way to fall off a cliff. So on a personal side, yeah, it's that I have wonderful people that have helped me get to where I am, and I'm eternally grateful for that. Yeah, it's important. In 20 seconds or less, do you think business owners are properly planning the future of their business, be it their legacy or the future growth of their business, generally speaking? Generally speaking, no. Um, I think mean, there's too much fear and uncertainty, and they're allowing that to be an excuse to uh, to not push themselves beyond what they think is possible. Uh, I, I don't put the I don't lay the blame there. I mean, that's why I've created the Executive Foresight Program, the Foresight Academy will be coming out in the fall is to empower the leaders and organizations to be able to envision what these futures may look like so they can make better decisions about their business, their products, and where they're going. So, you know, I would say that uh, they're not, um, um, and a lot of that's just due to the fact that uncertainty is uh, so high and there's a high degree of disruption. So, yeah. No. Was that 20 seconds? I don't know. I don't it know. was a good answer regardless. Thank you. So we'll, we'll I was practicing another all day. pass there. <laughs> All right, so knowing you're not a huge sports fan, although you are a cyclist, um, but you do have great thoughts around the future of all sports, and we talk about this a lot. I remember you and I playing golf one time, and you were saying how ridiculous it is, how long the game of golf takes. If you could, it doesn't have to be anything exotic, what's one thing you would change in the game of golf to make it more 2017 plus? Uh, I would put technology in the balls uh, so that you could, you know, and then uh, introduce augmented reality into this so that when the ball is hit, you can actually track it on your phone or some other type of device, whether it's through Google Glass or that effect. It helps to increase the engagement, but it also uh, creates a great amount of data about your swing, your hit, anything and everything, about the trajectory of the ball, the wind, all of that, uh, that could dramatically improve somebody's golf game. I'm in. Let's do it. Done. All right. Who's going to win the Super Bowl this year? What's the Super Bowl? <laughs> Good oh, question. Oh, man. I have no idea. Who, are you root, who would you root for? Well, you know, local I, team. I no, well, of course, I'd root for the local team if they got there. But uh, unless, of course, they were going up against the Cleveland Browns, a completely unrealistic possibility. But that's how I was raised. That's I was raised on the Browns. I love it. Yeah, I love it. So, how could we connect with you uh, on whether it be social, email, phone? What's the best way people could get in touch with you? Man, you know, the best way for people to get in touch with me, I say, is email. Right? We talked about email earlier. Uh, email me, Jared at the Jared Nichols Group dot com. Um, of course, I'm on social media. Um, LinkedIn is another way to connect, but uh, I always enjoy hearing directly from folks. So, uh, that's usually the best way. Well, Jared, it's been an absolute pleasure working with you. Thanks, talking man. To you Likewise, today. yeah. This was fun. Coming on. Well, it's absolutely awesome having you on this podcast. For those that don't know, Jared is a direct reason why this podcast is happening right now. From the encouragement of creative ideas and putting yourself out there to his excitement about the work we are doing at CADSource. The idea he comes up with and the work he does matters, and it motivates CADSource and myself specifically to create new ideas, which in turn leads to content like this podcast. The perspectives he brings to our business all the time and on this podcast specifically are now perspectives you as the business owner and entrepreneur can use for yourself. And for that, Jared, thank you. 
Oh, thank you, Eric. And for any business owner or entrepreneur that is looking ahead to the future of their business, be it concerns around disruption or creating a better future for you, your employees, or your business, I would encourage you to watch a person like Jared Nichols. He is someone that has impacted many businesses with his direct one-on-one consulting to his classroom work at the University of Tennessee, to his weekly videos, and his podcast. If you have questions, please feel free to reach out to Jared as we discussed, or you can contact me directly. You can contact me on Twitter, at Eric underscore Kaz, or with the same name on Instagram, or you can find us at kazsource.com with links to us on the different social networks. Thank you for listening to our Source podcast, Entrepreneur Perspectives, Building and Protecting Your Business, one podcast at a time. Until next time, we're out of here. A big thanks to West Connor Insurance for their support to the insurance community and for sponsoring this podcast. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. It's a big deal to us. We hope you found value in it. And if you did, we would be incredibly grateful if you gave us a review on iTunes. Remember to subscribe to this podcast and feel free to share it with anyone you know. More than anything, thank you again for listening. We appreciate it.